What was the difference between your education and the skills you actually needed to do your job? What if that job was life or death? Guys, I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran, and today we are checking out GoPro combat footage from, uh, this is from Sivdiv, or rather a member of his team from the Kharkiv Offensive. And we're going to be looking at how the Ukrainian Foreign Legion takes disparate soldiers, different levels of training, and operates as a cohesive unit. Now, let's get right into it. Okay, but first, I just want to acknowledge that uh, Sivdiv has said that the ad revenue from this video is going to be going to his buddy, uh, who obviously recorded it them himself. And if you want to make sure he gets the maximum ad revenue, what you would want to do is view this video yourself, right? Only watch my video after you've seen this one all the way through and maybe give it a second watch. Maybe just mute it and put it on in the background. I don't know. Do you do, do you know, whatever you want to do, but I think it's important to make sure you get as many eyes as possible on this sort of real footage because I think it shows uh, some of the reality of conflict. Let's get into it. Uh, All right. Petro Pavlika in the Kharkiv Offensive. Let's let, let's take a quick look on where that is on the map. We can pull that up right now because, of course, we can. This is a uh, this is this is this is modern conflict, right? Uh, Petro Pavlika. Yep. So Petro Pavlika is actually right here. No, that can't be right. It's Russian. That's Russian controlled. Uh, nope. There are many Petro Pavlikas. Huh. Petro Pavlivka. Petro Pavlivka in Luhansk Oblast. Weird. Huh. I wonder if this is misidentified. Odessa, Odessa. Uh, here's Zaporizhia, but it's not there. Oh, here it is in Kharkiv Oblast. There we go. That makes more sense. Okay, so as you guys can see, Petropavlivka is actually near where the Russians ended up finally creating a stable defensive line after the Ukrainian forces pushed through. Chances are these guys moved down. My guess would be this major roadway here to Kupiansk. Uh, they likely took Kupiansk and now we're on their way to uh other towns and here is petro pavlivka you guys can see it's a small village um, but an important intersection of a number of local roadways okay Russian attack in AGS, uh, they're coming here yes. hopefully coming here. hopefully wait 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 Okay, so here they are looking. This is one of the things that I think is so fascinating about this conflict is the way civilian and military technology has come together to you know, make this sort of thing happen. Now look here, we can actually see here's the river. Here is this oblong triangle intersection and the three prong roadways. So where they are is actually, uh, let's see, here's our oblong triangle. Here's the three intersections of roadways. And let's see if we can pull this up on the satellite terrain map so that we can get some insight. We can do a little bit better terrain analysis. All right, this is not great. <laughs> this is not great satellite layers. Um, but you guys can see here is Petro Pavlivka. And here you can see there's some buildings developed here. And they've identified themselves as being on the south east corner of this okay so they are right here and they're trying to i think advance northward um you guys it can probably have a sense of of the fact that there's all this open terrain that they have to cross but this is a pretty unexceptional village right but we are we are yes, here they, yeah and the russian position is this all uh, right to the this. okay i oh, know they are in the north and the russian position is to the south. Okay, so there's a previous video where they took out a BMP that was demonetized because YouTube doesn't want you showing any real combat. I may do a breakdown of that if I think I can get the editing right. But instead, let's take a look real quick at some of the gear. So this is by the Kharkiv Offensive. So this was in November, I think. Uh, 
I think it was November or December or November or October. And as you guys can see, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was like September, wasn't it? Okay. So as you guys can see, as far as gear, you're looking at a big upgrade of gear. You can see that he's got uh, these guys first, a hundred percent of them are wearing their helmets right there. That is a sign of a NATO trained unit. We've seen a lot of uh, Ukrainian like TDF units where they haven't had that firm discipline of everyone wearing their helmet. They're all wearing their helmet. I think they're all buckled up um, and they are most of them rocking plate carriers with plates. Okay, you want to see that funky move he just did? That is a classic. It's where you're trying to, uh, your plate carrier is slid a little bit and you've got to like wiggle your hips and slide your shoulders to get it to fit squarely. Because when your gear is a little bit uneven, if you're a backpacker, you already know this, uh, or if you've actually been on active duty in any sort of field unit, you know that when you have a bunch of gear and it's a little lopsided, when you march for eight hours, nine hours, that little bit of lopsided weight is going to start to really, it's going to pull on your spine, your neck, your shoulders, your low back. Everything is going to start to hurt because it's like walking with two uneven shoes. Your whole postural chain gets screwed up. So you always want to, you're always adjusting your gear to make sure it stays even. Okay, now I want to point out, look, this is like an M4. Uh, it's got an M68 ACOG and a foregrip. And you can see that the uh, re filmer, recorder here, is using it just to look out and uh, scan his sector. So as we've talked about in a lot of Ukraine combat footage, uh, because of the prevalence of anti-personnel mines, it seems like the norm is to uh, have everyone tread along the same path. This means that, of course, that way, if you enter a minefield, only the person, only the lead person will trip the mine and everyone behind them isn't at risk of walking into a mine themselves. Uh, this is uh, what's sometimes called a TTP. It's not the classically right answer in uh, military doctrine, especially when terrain is this open, uh, but it's the right answer in this conflict. And this is what the difference is between the theoretical training where you know, if I was in, say, my officer basic course or probably at ranger school, they would they would roast me for being in a ranger file. But because this is the threat of this environment, mines outweigh the threat of uh, mortars or IDF in this particular environment. Uh, they're going for a single file, a ranger file. I want you to also watch the lead person's head. And you guys know I'm going to link to his channel and to this video in the description. Okay, watch his head. Watch the, the, the man in front of him's head. He is always looking around. Always just looking left, looking right, looking left, looking left, looking right. Look, even the shooter himself, the filmer himself, looking, looking right. Yeah. And he points out that this low cloud ceiling means that they are actually uh, it's a good time for a ground assault because they can't be observed by drones or surveillance aircraft. You see, notice, too, he also looked back and checked on his buddies, checking their spacing, making sure they haven't gotten too spread out or too close and that everyone is still all right. And he Siv Div's pointing out that this is true. And we forget that we see the highlights of combat and we assume that we often say, oh, you know, combat is 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 one percent. Uh, one percent high intensity, ninety nine percent waiting around or nothing happening, and this is an example of that. But here's the problem: that one percent of nothing, nothing happening is in times like this. These guys are on, and I don't want to say on edge, right? They're in a good combat posture. They are ready for anything. They are keeping their head on a swivel. They're not tense. They're not uh, expending energy simply being anxious uh though i can guarantee it every one of them is definitely 
keyed up, right? They're on the, a, a good experienced combat soldier on a patrol like this is going to have their stress levels probably be at like, um, I'd say a, if 10, if 10 is direct, taking direct fire uh, and one is watching TV at home, they're probably going to be at between a four and a six, maybe a seven because they just came from contact with this BMP. So they know for a fact there's Russians here. But the wild thing is you'll hear the accents and you'll realize that these are all English speaking NATO, I believe NATO trained troops, but they just are able to work together and they don't need to communicate this formation because they sort of get it. And you can see they're starting to zigzag a little bit. This is normal. Um, this is also, you know, you're never walking a perfectly straight line, right? You're avoiding little mud traps. You're looking ahead. Rory, move. Faster? No, Rory. Oh, Rory. As you can see, they are just on the lookout. And I want you guys to understand that these sort of activities, likelihood of contact, you know, uh, a medium, uh, combat posture, again, four to six. These aren't doctrinal numbers. These are me using terms to explain it to you guys. Um, that is 99% of combat. So when people talk about combat stress, yeah, it's, it's, it's like the stress... The difference in stress between uh, being in a car accident and being like the caregiver to someone who's really sick, right? The the there's persistent, ongoing, chronic stress, and it's combined with the stress of uh, a, a, a like single traumatic event, and that's what makes combat so hard, right? Is that it's got the highest possible stakes. Um, and the highest possible level of pervasive threat. Because not only is there obviously the physical threat, but whether the commander, you know, everyone is worrying about other things like, what if I run out of water? What if I run out of food? Where's the ammunition going to come from? Uh, you know, how, how do I communicate? Uh, what if I get recognized, right? So there's all these recognized uh, or failed to be identified as a friendly uh, you know, there's all these these other concerns that are also life or death. They're just not imminently life or death. Yep, this is combat patrolling at its finest. And, and this is why I wanted to show this to you guys, is that not only is this a huge part of combat operations, uh, it's that the, notice they are doing a bunch of things right wordlessly. And this is the sign of a unit that's been operating together for a long time, is when they don't need to explicitly communicate a lot. Uh, good units, like we saw with the Ukrainian uh, Kraken Special Forces unit, those guys almost wordlessly did complex stuff like crossing linear danger areas with minimal communication and guidance. And that's just what happens when you work together for a long, long time. 
Now watch this, as they get closer to this BMP, this Russian vehicle, uh, where they, the last known position of the enemy, yep, they are dispersing a little bit wider. Why is that? Because look, let's say someone was at the BMP, they lined up on the lead man, and then they were to, you know, release a burst of automatic fire. Well, leaning up on the lead, the point man would, pat, would send rounds also directly in the path of all the other soldiers in the squad. So they disperse and form a zigzag formation where it's going to be harder to line up a target it's also easier if somebody starts taking fire one of the two sides can be can become a support by fire element and begin to flank around if necessary Notice how he's checking under the culvert, right, just in case. That's a sign of good training and honestly experience too. Uh, you know, if you've been in Afghanistan, you know, or Iraq, you know, checking culverts is like, it should be second nature. And you saw, it is. Even though that doesn't seem to be like a Russian tactic, um, it's just hard to deprogram good training. You also notice how the formation is kind of a living and breathing thing. When the micro terrain tightens, uh, they tighten their formation. When it's a little less restrictive, uh, they loosen their formation. Yeah, if you've ever seen top tier MMA fighters, you'll notice that even though they're in a cage fight, oftentimes, even as they're striking, you'll watch their bodies relax. And they have, they evolve this ability through training to relax even in high stress situations and only apply the uh, force, the max power when it's absolutely necessary to say throw a punch or, or, or hit a takedown. And you notice these guys are doing the same thing, right? This is the last known enemy position. But again, they, they are reasonable in their belief that there may not be enemy here anymore, that they may have withdrawn. But the they're still relaxed, but ready to react to contact. And relaxed but ready for anything is just a key essential part of any sort of combat, whether it's small unit combat in a counterinsurgency, uh, combat between two martial artists in a cage, or in this case, a conventional force on force conflict. How does it feel to be in a viral video and have you misstepping? Also, guys, when you carry this much gear, you get top heavy. Uh, and it means that minor missteps that wouldn't even affect you in the least uh, when it was just you like walking to the grocery store, it's going to trip you up way heavier, way more because you have, you're so top heavy. Yeah, he's like during combat patrols is necessary. Again, it's it's funny because one of the things that's unique about Sivdiv's experience level um, is that he was trained as a U.S. Marine, but never deployed to combat, and instead saw or also served with the YPG. I don't believe he was ever involved in like direct ground combat. I've never seen any videos or heard him indicate otherwise. Um, 
so his combat experience, his direct ground combat experience, I should say, right? I, it, I think he did a lot of like airstrikes and stuff or dealt with a lot of airstrikes um, as, when he was with the YPG. They, this is completely normal. Uh, you know, you can't train very, very highly trained units, may be able to automatically set security and that sort of thing. But when when you're a leader and you come upon a situation like this, uh, unique terrain, unique threat profile, um, you know, avenues of approach, you've got to just size it up and you, you got to tell people where to go. And here's the thing. If you're not screaming it, it's not that big a deal. Because just like how camouflage, we can see them all where they're at, even though they're wearing camouflage. So camouflage benefits you at distances beyond like 150 meters. Similarly, talking at a normal volume is not going to betray your position beyond 150 meters. And you've just, you've got to give clear instruction. Clear instruction is so valuable. I guess my point to talk about Civ Div's experience is that even in a in a uh, fully trained up, you know, NATO US unit, this is the amount of talking we would usually do on our patrols, which is minimal, but necess when necessary to array a formation to take care of a task, we would do it. Interesting. So they they're putting a lot of their combat power. You see two two of them are both facing this BMP and this last known enemy position. Again, sometimes we would actually do outward facing halts. We would let the the lead element face in, but I can't see where everyone else is facing and I I didn't really hear what his commander instructed them to do. So, also want to point out this weapon off safe I, I get it no judgment but but nah like keep that on safe until you are ready to fire oh they might be providing overwatch for someone who's searching a, a, a building even then someone wants to face out yeah you see maybe i think the person behind them might be facing out or that they may have this those two guys in front they may be out looking like looking sorry looking over here um covering uh, uh, over this hedgerow oh there they are yeah exactly exactly okay so they were in, they had they had someone when you have to search again this is something you saw it was almost instinctive you want to have in MP doctrine, we call it an outer cordon and an inner cordon. Um, the outer cordon protects the search element from external threats. The inner cordon provides cover, uh, a, a, well, a overwatch, basically, for the actual search element. So if they're checking out this building, then you're going to naturally have some guys look inward and sort of look around the area, and some of your guys are going to look outward and cover the, the surrounding area terrain You want me there too? Yeah. Sounds like the filmer is maybe French Canadian. Okay, so they're moving up to the BMP itself. Road is empty. And he says, okay, uh, he's talking about how the Cornet E missile launcher is still loaded. And yeah, so basically that this missile launch system uh, could have absolutely returned fire on them when they took it out. Uh, so what they're doing is moving up to this. I, I'm not going to second guess the team. 
at least when we in Afghanistan had this sort of situation where there was a possibility of, of enemy in an area, we would usually flank and go around. Like we wouldn't go run right up to it. We'd, we'd go around, we'd scout it out. And maybe that's what they were doing. Try to look at it from the outside. And then we'd have a search element go and search it from the inside. But it looks like they just pushed up and, and just to get eyes down the road. Again, it's, it, this is splitting hairs and, I want to point out that that it's it's again like martial arts, like the UFC fighting. Look at any two UFC champions. They're elite level fighters and all of them follow the same principles. Good striking, solid defense, uh, a sound strategy, uh, taking the fight to their opponent. But no two champs look alike. They look so different. And so you can sit there and, and describe good NATO tactics that are very different. Uh, again, is it wrong to spread out, search the exterior, get far side security, then search the BMP? Right. Uh, to make sure that it's not there's no uh, threats inside, you know, or you can get security, push to the BMP, look down the road and then search it. They're both good ways. They're both good plans. Well executed. And you make the best call you can in the middle of combat or in this case, the middle of a patrol. Right. And I hope there's no one in there. And you assume some risk. That's the other thing. Like he just said, I hope there's no one in there. Right. You assume some risk. Oh, it's clear. God, I wish you took that, take that weapon off safe. I get it. I get it. There's not that many civilians, but they're still your buddies and stuff, man. I don't know. Oh yeah, he points out, yeah, there's a car marked Z that was destroyed. Go, go, go. No, I know, but you just, you want us to have security on the road, right? Um, we can hold it from this compound with more cover. Okay, you notice that, how this guy told his team lead, hey, listen, we can get security on this side and have good cover. This is That's the sort of thing that is a sign, again, of mature non-commissioned officers, uh, especially. Now, whether these, he's an actual sergeant in this unit, whether he's just uh, uh, an experienced guy who got tagged as a team lead, um, or he's just sort of a de facto team lead uh, fulfilling that role. That's the kind of thing that at least I relied on my NCOs to do, right? At the end of the day, no amount of training is going to cover for the fact that you're a human being with one brain. As a team lead, you have a bigger, broader focus. And so, you know, there was just an expectation that team leads would sit there and go, hey, listen, you're doing X, but it actually doesn't make that much sense. Why don't why don't we do Y to achieve the same effect with less work, better cover? Uh, and, you know, my good NCOs, every NCO got listened to. That's what happens when you're a non-commissioned officer. You you get to be listened to. Um, and, and honestly, most of my enlisted soldiers, too, like I would at least hear them out. Um, you know, NCOs, you get to be listened to and you always are taken seriously. Did they? They did I always do what they suggested? Not always. Sometimes they didn't see the whole picture. That meant they couldn't do X or Y or Z. But that's what you rely on them for, in those moments, to sit there and get these small tactical problems and find better or more effective ways to solve them. Which again is like, hey, I want this. You see how they're setting a perimeter here, or a uh, a basically a security. Perimeter is not the right word. They're setting security. So, okay, they were here. They're moving down here. They're at this intersection. And then they're going to be, they're setting like security down this road, down this road. And then this is the road where they were facing down with the BMP, I think. Um, so, of course, you're going to want to set your security on two sides, move down here. Um, and so they're just trying to solve that problem the most effective way possible. We're gonna be right here instead of some micro terrain. We're gonna keep eyes down this fucking. Road. This is classic squad leader stuff. This is like ten. This is I mean team leader stuff. 
This is that is exactly what I expect my team leads leaders to do just to come in, get told, hey, get security down this road. They solve the problem. They know exactly where their guys are and they provide them clear, simple direction. This, this is yeah. classic gotcha. NCO in combat. Interesting, too, that your team lead is also your RPG gunner. I don't want to be in the eyes of that. Mm hmm. I'd take a prone. I was trying to tell him you should you should get prone. Hey, don't, don't shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot. He got blue tape on his Ukraine. helmet. Slav Ukraine! Jabroni! Hey, we got Okay, so you see they saw movement and immediately they were like, don't shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot, because they identified the blue tape. You see how hard friend and foe identification is. Yeah, a lot of trouble is a is an understatement. We got, it's friendly. Yeah. And then equally important is telling others <laughs> that, hey, because others may not see the blue tape. The angle may be different. So you want to communicate as best you can. Was right. that a friendly for sure? Yeah, I saw blue. Pick up, Arnie. Interesting. I want to know this film, the, the recorder's military experience. He moves a lot with the weapon barrel up. We always moved weapon barrel down because, you know, round up, come back down, bad. And he has this weird habit of keep, it seems like keeping his weapon off safe. Um, and again, the US military, very neurotic. I wonder if the Canadian military is similar. And remember, these guys could also come from even different backgrounds. He could, for example, be uh, a, a Canadian police officer or uh, have experience as a Canadian border security officer, right? There's a lot of other paramilitary experience that these guys could be drawing on so it could be something where yeah in the canadian uh royal canadian mounted police for example it could be completely normal to carry uh your carbines uh barrel up the important thing is that you're not pointing at other people while it's off safe Okay, interesting. So it looks like it what, it what it looks like almost as though they've confirmed that the Ukrainian forces have taken the town and that they are going to set up security inside this building, probably to get on top and get overwatch. They can see a much greater area around them without having to set so many of their personnel on security. Yeah, it is. I'm not going to fucking do that. Too exposed. No. Ooh, jazz hands denied. That was Russian, he was dead. Yeah. <laughs> the watch is upside down, so you can check the watch without having to let go of anything, right? If you're holding a weapon or something, you can check your watch much more easily with the face on the bottom of the wrist. Okay, we're gonna go from the edge. Here, you guys fucking take the on the right? Yeah. Hey. I want to point out, this guy's got a U.S. issue um, 40 millimeter grenade launcher. Roger, we're gonna take the right side of this building. You have a flashlight. I gotta take this off. Again, you notice some of the good leadership at work here, where he's just providing clear, simple direction. We're gonna clear this building. You've got the flashlight, so get the flashlight ready, etc. You also notice how important it is to have your gear across your team. Uh, not everyone has a flashlight, not everyone has a 203, not everyone has an RPG, but the squad has all of these things. Because remember, these guys are pretty relaxed. The Russians are right across the street, as we just said. If it's fucking too dark, switch with me, okay? Got it. Pick up the top for me, yep. I got right, and even though they look relaxed, they're clearing a building, and as we know, in a few within a few feet of Russians. Hey, there's no entrance. Still on semi. Ah. Uh, 
Ah. I would Check like the to right throw. Side. I would like. No, that's just the hallway. It's a pool, hey. ta pool table in there. Giggles. 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 My door is blocked because the roof caved in on it. Do you need us to enter your part or no? Okay, so right now, again, even like clearing buildings like this is, is it's more art than science. You know, at this point, I think their goal is just to put eyes on every room. They know that if, if they can't get in here, chances are the Russians can't. And if this guy can get on the second floor and look in through the collapsed roof and see that it's clear, it's pretty much just as good. So they're just trying to solve, again, you notice how combat is just solving so many little problems uh, that that's why the U.S. military in a typical platoon will have a platoon leader, a platoon sergeant, three squad leaders, and a total of what, like nine team leaders? So you're looking at 50% of the unit dedicated to leadership. Um, but that's because, look, he's got to solve these all these tiny micro problems of like, okay, well, they can't clear this room, but maybe someone across the way can clear the room. Okay, we need to get security down the road. Okay, well, why don't we just uh, reposition our guys here and here? This is, this is how the NATO militaries work and it's why they are such flexible units. This is a pool room. Okay. Like billiard pool. Okay. You wanna launch a nade in there? <laughs> no. They're like absolutely not. Yeah. Like, we're actually going to randomly toss grenades into rooms of a half-collapsed building. Trying to hear what he's saying. Yeah. Roger, did you guys clear second story? Did you hear him? They said they're coming out, right? This is important when you're clearing a building, right? You, if people suspect there could be enemy in there, you don't want to startle someone by bursting through the door and filing out, right? You just want to let them know so that they can manage their expectations. Also, look at all those grapes. That's really beautiful. See all the, I think they're grapes. That's crazy. I wonder if they made their own wine, obviously, before the war. This building's clear. See, again, they had to improvise, they had to adapt, but they got the building clear. There was a friendly? Yeah. Yeah, there were friendlies down there. Really? Oh, yeah, I'm so proud of the team. I'm so proud of the team. I'm so proud the team. I'm so proud of 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 the team. I'm so all right, guys, that was really interesting. Again, check out the video. Watch it all the way for yourself. Um, definitely contribute towards making this thing go viral here. I mean, I'm going to do my part and give it a like. Obviously, I'm already subscribed. Um, so thanks, guys. As always, if you want access to the Uncensored Combat videos, the kind that I can't show you on YouTube, uh, you want to become a member of the Patreon. Thanks so much to my Lieutenant Tier patrons. You guys are the ones who make this whole thing possible. Um, and I will see all you guys in the next one.